tech gadgets are seducing us into new types of relationships. But what kinds of relationship can you have with a machine? It's complicated, but let's find out. Noel Sharkey, University of Sheffield. Hi everyone. Uh, before I start, I just because I'm going to be get a, probably get a little bit negative, but I'm actually very passionate about AI. Uh, I started in AI in the in the 70s, so it's been 40 years, uh, and I love the technology we've created. But for the last probably 10, 12 years, um, I've become I've gone from poacher to gamekeeper to look at the, our responsibility for the technology we, we've created and we're still creating. So that's the approach I'm giving you today. Okay. So what kind of relationships can we have with our technology? Friend, companion, personal, romantic, controlling, loving, adversarial, servile, professional, therapeutic. I'll answer that at the end. But now I'm going to just look a little bit, tell you a little bit about being human and what it is to be, you know, what humans' failties are. Um, I, I also have a PhD in psychology, so I like to look at that. So we're looking here of what you can see. We can see faces in everything. Designers have been exploiting this for centuries. I mean, right back in ancient Egypt, they had little puppets that exploited our tendencies to see faces and movement and things. This was on my flight over and the stewardess said, oh, where'd you get that face from? I said, it's from your cupboard there. She was quite surprised. Now that's called par pareidolia. And pareidolia is a part of something we call anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is our projection of human-like qualities into machines, into inanimate objects actually, or gods, uh, or animals, but I'm talking here about inanimate machines. So we project into those. Now way back, the end of the uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there was a very clever horse called Hans that changed the face of biology. Now Hans had this skill and he wasn't specifically trained for it, he was just rewarded every time he got it right. He had this specific skill, you hold up a little blackboard with a problem on it like five times four, and Hans would type it, tap out 20, or, or the appropriate response. He could do the same with clocks, he could do it with all sorts of things, and everybody was stunned by it. The Berlin Academy of Psychology did an investigation, they ran a commission, they had circus trainers, they had all these people, and they all ended up saying, Yes, Hans was a really intelligent being that thought like humans. That was the response. 1907, a young psychologist had a different idea. So he had a go at Hans. And what he did was he got actors to hold up the, the board. And the actors had to keep a very straight face so that they weren't giving anything away. Lo and behold, Hans still got the problems right. So then his next step, which is a clever psychological step, he, held, he got the actors to hold up the board, but they didn't see the problem. They didn't know what they were holding up. And Hans was completely useless, tapped out randomly. So for me, I thought it was still clever, because what the horse was doing was going from exact facial expressions, tiny facial expressions, even of the actors. So at that point, biology went for this thing of, let's not be anthropomorphic anymore about animals. Let's develop an objective science. That was 2007. By 2012, Loeb wrote a book called Mechanistic Biology. And that put a real objective biology in place that what we've got today with all our medicine and everything else, we start talking about uh, moths having a desire to fly into flames, those kinds of things. Now, we haven't done that with AI so much. I mean, I worked in machine learning for, since 1981, and we use mathematical descriptions. But nonetheless, in the lab, people just talk very generally. You'll hear people here talking about AI as if it was a, a, an entity, um, but it's just a machine. So, so this anthropomorphism is, is rife. Now, you all remember the Trojan horse, I'm sure. Um, 
that came into the city of Troy, was pulled in, was left there, and then when at night time, all the soldiers crept out. Well, I use the word Trojan terms for much of what happens in AI. So people use terms like cognition, thinking, um, guilt, guilt's a good one. Ron Arkin, who's developed a, an ethical governor for, for military machines, well, he was trying to, he didn't succeed really, but he tried to, had guilt in there because he thought that you know, this machine should feel guilty. But for him, guilt was a simple mathematical function, like a thermostat. It, 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 every time it got something wrong, it incremented by one until it reached a threshold and then it stopped functioning. So he called that guilt. And that was fine as a technical, you know, if he stuck to the technical thing. But the problem for readers is, it's like a Trojan horse when all the normal linguistic meanings of guilt start pouring out and people start misinterpreting what it's about. In fact, Ron himself describes it, and then later on in the next chapter, he starts talking about guilt like Dostoevsky, about a machine feeling guilty and how, you know, when, when it kills someone, it feel guilty about it. So that's the kind of thing. So it can infect researchers as well. And in fact, it's all about the labeling. It's very dangerous what you say about what you're doing, by either labeling your program or labeling the behavior of your robot or your AI system. Because when you, with the label, um, you get, as I said, uh, you get things like cognition or understand, understand the Now, when I was working in the Yale AI labs in 1982, the early 80s, there was a professor there, Drew McDermott, who wrote a paper for graduate students saying, don't use terms like understand in your program. We we're all working in natural language then, because you come to believe it yourself. And he advised them to use something like call the program loop G5097 and then let other people say it understood, not you, because you only believe it yourself. And it's one of the problems, it dogs all of us. We can't help but be anthropomorphic about our equipment. So going back to relationships very quickly, um, here's the kind, do we, which of these do we have, what sort of relationships do we have? Now this is a romantic sexual relationship. How do you feel about sex? Sex is one of the most fascinating things in the world. I don't think there is anything wrong with it. This is probably going to get Saudi citizenship at some time, I think. Um, so we have sex robots, romantic relationships, we have the Hello Barbie, we have in, in elder care, in child care robots being developed that have relationships with people. And people actually, when something moves in a certain sort of a way, even if it's remote controlled, people start thinking it has some sort of cognition, some sort of mental aspects. Soldiers in Iraq get bonded with their... Um, E, what do you call it, bomb disposal robots that you remote control. They take them fishing with them and put a little uh, fishing hook in its claw. They actually start believing that it can, it's one of them and some soldiers even risk their lives for their robot, which is crazy, but that's how deeply it runs. Now, the Einstein robot here is by Hansen Robotics and I, I really love this one. It's one of my favorites because the way it moves, I mean, the, the animations that David Hansen does are, are remarkable and I have nothing against them whatsoever, or any of this stuff really, apart from the deception that it involves. Now Einstein has been programmed in California and it can, what it can do is it can mimic human expressions, smiling, disgust, those kinds of things, but it uses the Ekman system to classify your emotions. So if you smile at Einstein, it smiles back, admittedly a little spooky, but it, it smiles back at you. But there's a big divide between being able to express emotions and categorize emotions and actually feel them. That's a discontinuity there. And if you were to ask Einstein, is there anybody home in there? So what kind of relationship can we have? Well, at best, we can have a fictive relationship. There's a one-way street here. A machine can't love you back. It can only, you can love it, you can be bonded to it, but it doesn't know anything about you, it doesn't care about you at all. 
But worse, you can have a, it can have a controlling relationship to you. Because if people keep on hyping the technology and talking about the future as if it was exists, when I hear people saying, when we get general intelligence, not if. I'm a scientist and I like scientific uncertainty and doubt and evidence. I have no evidence for that. There's a discontinuity here. AI is not getting smarter. Our machines are getting faster. We're using the same techno techniques I used in the 80s. They're getting faster, they're getting better, and brilliant engineering achievements all together. We have beat blue, we have, you know, to begin with, beat chess players, now all chess players can be beat. We have AlphaGo that beat the world's best Go players, and I love that, but it's very narrow in a closed domain. When you talk about, is that a step towards adaptive uh, general intelligence, you have to think, well, if you knew somebody who could tell you what moves to make, didn't know what was playing the game, had no idea, didn't know what it meant to play the game, didn't care less what happened in the game, didn't give you a high five afterwards, couldn't have a conversation with you, couldn't even make you a cup of tea. Would you call them super intelligent? I certainly wouldn't. So that, that was my view on that. And the problem here is that by talking, I don't mind people doing being ambitious, I don't mind people doing research on this, but by hyping it up all the time, you're creating the wrong idea. Our public institutions, our militaries, I mean, I'm talking about militaries worldwide, are all talking about, are all using, a, recognizing AI. The police are using it for predictive policing, for deciding in judicial sentences, mortgages, loans, all those things are, are going with algorithms, algorithmic decisions, and it's a complete mess. It's been shown very clearly that this has strong gender bias, it has strong race bias. The darker the color of your skin, the more biased it is. It's terrible, it's a mess. And so I'm asking, you're all working as AI companies, all I'm asking you is, do all the ambitious work you want, and I find that companies are actually very responsible about what they say about their apps. But because of the hype, people are in our public institutions and our militaries are buying snake oil. I spend all, half my life at the UN campaigning with another 104 NGOs to get these new weapons stopped. AI weapons, because the military doesn't understand it. And if you keep hearing all this sort of nonsense about where we're going with AI, they'll go that. So all I'm saying here is I appeal to all of you, please do all your AI, but please be very careful about what you say about it. Tell the truth. We don't want machines ceding control of dumb, narrow AI machines controlling our lives. Thank you very much.